Hey there, hope you're going well. I'm Jade the Beamer and I'm super excited today to be talking to you about The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. This is the prequels to the YA dystopia phenomena, The Hunger Games. Ah, I have so much to say about this book. I'm so happy that I can be here talking to you about it. So let's go. If you haven't heard of The Hunger Games, it's set in this dystopian world called Panem, which is based off of post-apocalyptic North America. Society is divided into 12 districts, with a capital ruling over them all. The districts rebelled against the capital, and as retribution for this mistake, the capital have insisted on a annual Hunger Games, where two children ages 12 to 18 from each district are randomly chosen to compete in a contest to the death. The Hunger Games trilogy has The Hunger Games as the first book, Catching Fire as the second and my personal favourite, and Mockingjay as the final instalment. Our main character, Katniss Everdeen, volunteers for the 74th annual Hunger Games, and our whole series revolves around her and her efforts to bring down the capital. This book was published last year in 2020 and is the prequel, so this takes place during the 10th Hunger Games. Our main character is Coralina Snow, aka President Snow from the Hunger Games trilogy, the ruler of Panem and our ultimate villain. We see him as an 18 year old, which is very interesting and it's so intriguing to see him, where he came from, how he reasons his way through all of this convoluted and awful stuff, and how ultimately he ends up in power. This is the first book I read in 2021 and I rated it a 4 out of 5 stars, or a 75%. I really enjoyed it, I thought it was so interesting and unique. It kind of reminded me of the Joker movie, which is one of my favourite movies. I love reading about villains' perspectives and understanding just why they do what they do, even if you wish they didn't do what they do. I love the dive back into the world of the Hunger Games and all of the explanations and history we get behind everything that we know from the trilogy. The writing style is so unique. I don't know how to pronounce President Snow's first name. The way that Koyo thinks is so structured and narrow-minded and Suzanne Collins' writing reflects that beautifully and terrifyingly. There are gays in here, woo! <laughs> I will say though that while this book was split into three different sections and featured a Hunger Games, it was quite slow paced overall, especially the first two sections. It was really when we got to the third section that I was on the edge of my seat and I thought that the Hunger Games that took place in here was a bit boring. That was just me. Another criticism is that there are two characters in here, Coralinus, the main character, and Sejanus, and I just kept cracking up whenever I read either of their names, and that happened a lot because they both end with anus. I don't know if that's common. I have a feeling that most of the names in here are based on Greek origins. I'll get to why I think that is a bit later, but I just thought it was so funny. <laughs> I couldn't take him seriously, to be honest. I get why they call him President Snow in the trilogy, because imagine all of the memes that would have taken place in Panem. And the last thing I think that I didn't overly like about this novel is that the characters that you root for that stand out and stand for goodness don't get a happy ending. And I do think that's typical of villain stories. Obviously, we're interested in seeing how they come out on top, but it's just a little bit of a bummer. And I understand why I waited until this year and not the ruins of 2020 to read this one, because I think it just would have destroyed me on a whole nother level. That's pretty much all I can say about this without spoiling you. Please go and read it. Read the Hunger Games trilogy first. I do believe that you need to do that before picking this one up, just so you understand what's going on. Go read the Hunger Games, read this, come back and we can discuss, okay? Okay. Goodbye, people that haven't read The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Goodbye! Don't
don't get spoiled. Goodbye. Okay, let's get real. So the first page has all of these quotes about government, I believe, and about literature. There's one from Wordsworth, there's one from Frankenstein, there's some from Treaties of Government. And I just thought that was an interesting way to start it out, a likening art with rules. And this whole book is about how Snow makes are uh, out of rules so fitting the first section is called the mentor part two is called the prize and part three is called the peacekeeper so we get an introduction into Coriolanus's life he lives with his cousin tigris and we know tigris from mockingjay when she is a capital citizen who's been transformed into this tiger woman and she harbors katniss and the rebels so throughout this whole book we're wondering how did she go from loving snow to that and i'm pretty sure the answer is all of these years in between the main thing to understand about this book and about snow is that this takes place 10 years after the rebellion and obviously the districts lost that battle district 13 got nuked and that was where all of the Snow's money was invested in the munitions in District 13. When that was destroyed, so was the Snow's fortune. And as a result, Snow has grown up very poor. During this rebellion, the rebels cut off the capital's food supplies from the districts for two years. And as retribution, the capital have kind of flipped that on its head and that's why the Hunger Games are called the Hunger Games. Basically, the capital are petty There are two words in here that I hadn't heard of before, tesserae and cocksure. As the Snows have had a hard time, their motto, their family motto is snow lands on top. So no matter how bad things get, they'll come out successful in the end. Tigris and Snow live with their grandma, who's called the Grand Ma'am, I believe, because she's really bossy and old, I guess. And she grows roses on their roof, and those are like her prized possessions. We get to the reaping, which takes place on the 4th of July, so I'm pretty sure that's like Independence Day for America or something, which is very weird. The Hunger Games do not install a sense of independence for me. In this Hunger Games, the 10th Hunger Games, Coralinus and some of his fellow students at the Capital Academy are chosen to be mentors for the tributes. This is the first time that tributes have had mentors, and throughout this book we can tell that the Hunger Games are still kind of in development. They are nowhere near the same in terms of rules as they are when we see Katniss take part in them. And basically, Snow is excited to be a mentor because it gives him a chance to win a prize. And this prize is money, which he needs to go to university and to gain power because his dream is to become the president of Panem. Sejanus, who I mentioned before, is from the Plinth family. And the Plinths came from District 2, but they had their money invested in munitions and obviously District 2 still stuck around. And so they became rich very quickly. The reaping takes place and Coralinus is assigned the girl from District 12 and he's bummed about that because he thinks there's no way that a girl from the poorest district is going to win the Hunger Games so he thinks he's stuffed. The reaping happens and the tribute is a girl called Lucy Gray Bard. I think I'm just gonna call her Lucy Gray Bard because I don't know how to pronounce her last name but it's quite fitting for her because she's a performer. And when she gets raped, she puts a snake down the dress of the mayor's daughter, which is very funny. And when she gets on stage, she just grabs the mic and starts singing this song about how they can't take anything away from her. And I just thought that was so cool. And I'm so glad that a bard was included in this book. She's wearing this rainbow ruffled dress which we learn was her mother's and she's gone now. So while the capital had their supplies cut off, things got very serious. People were resorting to cannibalism and we learned that one of Snow's classmates cannibalized their maid which just shows how serious 
this dystopia is. Back to Lucy Gray. So she is part of this group called Bukovi, who are basically these traveling performers. They used to travel, but the Peace Cube has basically rounded them up and put them in District 12. So they've kind of lost that aspect of their identity, but they're still very cohesive and strong and music is their life. With Kobe, so hear me out. Was that name at all inspired by COVID? That's all I could think about when I first saw it because the timing of the book makes sense for that and Covey, Covid, they both travel, they both spread, like music is infectious in that as soon as you hear it you can pass it on to someone else. I don't know, that's just my theory. Anyway, the tributes are assigned mentors and it's just weird seeing how little respect the tributes get. They're, they aren't even given names on their sheet it's just boy, girl. Which does make me wonder if the LGBTQ community is recognised in this world. Would gender fluid or gender diverse or transgender tributes be considered? Don't know. So with the whole Greek names thing. So we've got Coralanus, which sounds Greek. We've got Livia. We've got Sejanus. We've got Persephone, we've got Festus, we've got Iphigenia, we've got Apollo, we've got Diana, we've got Vipsania, we've got Pliny, we've got Hilarius, we've got Androcles, we've got Arachne, we've got Clemencia, we've got Lysistrata, and I just think that all of those names have Greek origins. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And thinking to the Hunger Games trilogy, we've got capital names like Caesar and Cressida. And I just think that's too much of a quinky dink. So my theory is that Suzanne wrote the capital to kind of be like a repetition of history. So obviously the Greek Empire back in the day were like the most powerful people on the planet basically. Their empire was unquestionable for some time in history. So I think that the capital is trying to rebrand themselves as the new Greece, saying that they are this all-powerful empire. That's just a thought. Two of the mentors are twins, which is cool. With Snow, his mother died of childbirth and the baby that was to be his sister also passed away in the, that process and his father was shot by a rebel sniper so he's an orphan now and he and Tigris basically look after themselves and their grandmam and looking back on it it kind of struck me how how much Snow thought of his mum but then after thinking about how she died he says it just shows that she wasn't tough enough for this world I'm like you love her right you miss her and you don't think that she was tough even though she died of childbirth like what i really like the inclusion of songs in here it made it pass a lot more quickly for me and it was just really cool to imagine what those songs sounded like we had a version of roses are red violets are blue from his mother sejanus was probably my favorite character in this book which of course marked him for death the other mentors are saying, who cares about these tributes anyway? And Sejanus is like, possibly their families? So the tributes are taken to the capital and placed in the zoo, which again is a mark of disrespect. And Coralanus is the only one that went to greet Lucy because he wants to give them the every opportunity to succeed and win. So he goes to the zoo and feeds Lucy and the other mentors kind of copy him. And one of them is waving a sandwich in front of their tribute like mocking them saying oh come on grab the sandwich i bet you can't basically they look away and the tribute stabs them in the neck and arachne is dead now the tribute takes a bite of the sandwich and is shot immediately by the peacekeepers so that's one down that we don't have to worry about as competition for lucy so the dean high bottom of the academy is given credit for coming up with the hunger games idea and dr ghoul who's this scientist, is the head game maker. So Coralanus has to answer to these two people quite a lot. And he is assigned to come up with a proposal for the Hunger Games, how to get people to invest in them more. And he and his classmate Clemencia have to do this together. But Clemencia is so torn up about Arachne's death that Snow says, look, it has to get done, I guess I have to do it myself. 
It's like the typical group project where you have to do everything because the other people just don't want to. And in that moment, I felt, I felt him. <laughs> Anyway, so Snow comes up with the proposal for people to be able to sponsor tributes so they can send in money which turns into food and water and you can, you know, be more invested in the Hunger Games and help them to win and succeed. So he sends the proposal to Dr. Ghoul and Dr. Ghoul brings them both in and says, look, did you both write this? And Clemency's like, yeah. Meanwhile, Dr. Ghoul is over this tank of like rainbow coloured snakes. And Dr. Ghoul drops the proposal into the tank and says, okay, pick it up for me, Clemencia. So Clemencia reaches her hand in and is immediately bitten heaps of times by these snakes and, you know, starts screaming. And Dr. Ghoul tells Snow that the snakes wouldn't bite anyone whose scent they recognise. And because Snow solely wrote the proposal, his scent would be on it and he wouldn't be harmed by the snakes. Clemencia goes to hospital and is branded a liar and while Snow visits her in hospital he finds these scales spreading across her which is very concerning to read about. It was nice to watch how Snow developed from just caring about Lucy as a means of a prize and a logical victory and actually came to care about her as a person and was invested in her survival. The mentors and tributes to go to visit the arena, which is in the capital, and it was just nice, like when they were walking through that tunnel in the dark for that moment, for them to just hold hands and be united. There was this nice line that said, a raindrop in a flood, a pebble in an avalanche, and I'm pretty sure that's how Coralinus was describing how he felt or how he imagined the tributes would feel in this arena. The arena just seems like an arena. Um, so what I imagined was like a open space f surrounded by seating and apparently there are tunnels around that. They step into the arena and bombs start going off. Many tributes are killed. A I think a couple of mentors are killed and Coralinus jumps over Lucy's body to protect her. And the boy from District 12, his name's Jessup, he leaps over his mentor to protect her as well. I don't think it's confirmed where these bombs came from. I believe they were just planted there by rebels. Grandmam describes that as the kind of story that catches fire. And I'm like, good one, Suzanne, reference to your own book. I like it. So the commentator for this Hunger Games is Lucky Flickerman, and I'm guessing that's an ancestor to Caesar Flickerman from the Hunger Games. They each get interviews and Lucy uses the opportunity to sing a song. He says, I know the soul you struggle to save, too bad I'm the bet you lost in the raping. So back in District 12, she was romantically involved with this Covey guy called Billy Torp, and apparently he was also involved romantically with the mayor's daughter, Mayfair. And Mayfair was jealous of Lucy, so he t she told her dad to pick Lucy Gray's name and make her a tribute, and that's why Lucy put the snake down her dress at the reaping. Throughout this book, the Dean is a very interesting character because we obviously found out that he came up with the idea for the Hunger Games, but he seems opposed to them. So we know that there's something there. On page 199, he says, the capital won the war only after a long, hard fight and recently our arena was bombed. To imagine that on either side we lack intelligence, strength or courage would be a mistake. And Lucky says, Surely you're not comparing us to them, right? I mean, we're obviously better. And the Dean says, One look tells you ours have had more food, nicer clothing, and better dental care. Assuming anything more, a physical, mental, or especially a moral superiority would be a mistake. That sort of hubris almost finished us off in the war. And he's so sarcastic as well. Lucky says, Oh wow, that's interesting. Your opinion's great. And the Dean's like, I can't think of anyone whose opinion I value more. He is a roaster. The Dean is a roaster, I'll give him that. While the bombs were going off in the arena, one of the tributes took that opportunity to try and escape, so they ran. And that tribute was Sejanus's tribute it's from District 2. Because Sejanus is from District 2, he was his classmate. So when the Hunger Games start, they see that tribute Marcus strung up, hooked on these poles, obviously tortured and dying and Sejanus gets really upset, and this is one of the things that brands him as a kind of rebel and a traitor. The Hunger Games starts, and we learn that Jessup, the District 12 boy, 
caught rabies in the zoo from a rat so he like goes feral and dies i really like the line on 274 when Coralanus has to give a thumbs up to the camera and he says he could not believe that this was his life <laughs> he's so done before lucy went into the arena Coralanus gave her a napkin full of food because they were starving her and he also gave her his mother's compact, which was a prized possession for him. And he filled that with rat poison instead to give her a chance to poison what, some of the other tributes. While she's in the arena as well, he learns that Dr. Ghoul plans to put the tank of snakes in the arena. And so while no one's looking, he drops a handkerchief in there that she gave him, which her scent would be on so the snakes won't attack her. After the games, after the tributes have killed each other and she's poisoned a couple and she uses the snakes to kill someone else and the snakes obviously don't hurt her, Lucy Gray is the victor. Snow is called into the Dean's office where on the table are the napkin, the compact and the handkerchief. Five minutes later, he signs up to be a peacekeeper and that's the last part of the book. He was caught cheating, so he's banished from the capital, basically. I kind of relate to Snow in some ways. Like, he says that he was sick of having this kind of butter two meals in a row. And I'm like, I get sick of food too when I have it too much. He's so relatable. And he also gets heat rashes. I'm like, with the same sensitive skin. The Dean is so hardcore. He's like, you hear that? That's the sound of snow falling. I'm like... Mic drop. So, so, so Snow is banished to District 12, which is his life falling apart basically because he can't support his family anymore, he can't go to university, his ambitions are blown to pieces. And it was kind of hard um, reading about him considering taking his own life. But then Sejana shows up, he's also been banished and is now a peacekeeper with Snow. And he's like, we have to survive, like, come on, we've beaten them. I've got you. Sejanus is such an interesting perspective because he knows life in the capital and he knows the struggles in the districts. Snow is saying, we put so much money into the districts, why aren't the living conditions better? Because he's looking around seeing all these shacks and starving people. And Sejanus says, we pour money into our industries, not into the districts themselves. These people are on their own. On page 364, there are a couple of songs and I just love how I can hear how they would go. So there's one that goes, burn it, spurn it, don't return it, break it, bake it, overtake it. And it's just like such an upbeat song. And then there's one about Clementine, which I thought was really beautiful. You know what else we have in this book that made me go, <gasps> are you? are you come into the tree and we're like oh yeah this is the origin story of that song so snow is a peacekeeper when this rebel is rounded up and taken to the hanging tree and he's getting hanged because apparently he put a bomb in the mine and that killed three people while he's being hung his lover shows up and screams and he says no run and that's his last word so it's like that's the story of that song and that's why it's so rebellious because it's about a rebel and it's about a rebel telling his love to run from the peacekeepers it was cool to learn how the covey name themselves so their first name is derived from a ballad and their second name is derived from a color so i thought that's cool so snow has the idea to eradicate the mockingjays from district 12 because he sees them as like a dirty abomination that is a rebellion from the capital so they support his idea and he starts rounding up jabber jays and we learn more about them how they only record human voices how they can be put in different modes and it's really interesting to learn how nature has been manipulated in this book he was talking to lucy about freedom of speech and stuff and lucy's like do you think you could honestly say what you feel and not be harmed from it by the capital and he's like yeah but then he's also like mm, probably not on page 422 koryo has the guts to say it's not my fault i don't run panem i give up <laughs> no not yet president snow anyway so lucy gray's name is from the wordsworth ballad 
called Lucy Gray and her name is special because it's a ballad and it's also a colour and a ballad. On page 430, the gays, yes, one of the Covey, Barb, is visited by a woman, yeah. So there's the little Covey girl called Maud Ivory and she's so cute. She's complaining about her shoes and she says, these shoes don't walk right. It's interesting how Lucy changes Snow's perspective slightly. She says to him, so the capital will keep me safe apparently because it's in the hunger games so what do i get in return and she says it's not worth giving up her freedom for that and it was interesting to consider snow sejanus and the kobe go into the woods and they come across katniss i'm like katniss everdeen no but apparently that's one potatoes so oh yeah there's the deep in the meadow song i like the song on page 456 that's like i'll sell you for a song so while sejanus and snow are rounding up the jabber jays sejanus starts telling snow that he plans to break the lover rebel out of jail and escape to the north where the capital can't persecute them anymore and snow hits record on one of the jabber jays and that gets sent to the capital and a little bit later sejanus is hung and that was just really awful because he was such a good person favorite character bites the dust <laughs> While Lucy was performing, she, Snow, Sejanus, this other rebel dude were talking with Billy Torp. And Mayfair, the mayor's daughter, walks in and sees Snow, Sejanus, and Lucy with these rebels. And so Snow on instinct shoots her so that she can't dob them in. But the rebel guy, Spruce, takes the guns and hides them. So Cor Coralinus only hopes that they're safe and he can't be penalized. Spruce ends up dead only thing kind of tying him to the murder are these guns and he doesn't know where they are and basically things just start getting more desperate and he's pulled into the peacekeeper office and told that he can be the youngest officer ever because he passed the test but lucy says look we're gonna get caught eventually for murder we need to run away now so he packs his things makes a plan with her to go up north and they make it through the woods and he's like, oh, this doesn't seem to be the thing for me. I don't like dirt. And they come across this cabin and in the cabin are these guns. And meanwhile, Lucy is suspicious of him killing Sejanus and he finds the guns and is thinking, this is the only proof that I killed someone. If I get rid of these guns, I can go back and have a life and be an officer. Lucy kind of senses this because she's like, I'm going to go out and um, pick some Katniss. And she goes out and, and then Snow figures out that, wait, if I get rid of the guns, Lucy still knows what happened and she can dob me in. So he goes after her, intending to explain that, but instead thinks that she's gonna go for the guns, so he randomly shoots. Do you think Lucy Gray is dead? I don't know. I really hope not, but I think she probably is. So that's a loose end gone. He gets rid of the guns and there's nothing that can tie him to the murder anymore. So he goes back to the peacekeepers and that is the end of the love story between him and Lucy. My panic when he found the guns, I instantly knew that something bad was going to happen, that he had to get rid of Lucy as a loose end. So panicked. Even if I could logically reason everything he had done up until now. That was the point where I was like horrified by him. And I was like, I can't support you anymore. This is your turning point as a villain. When you see the people you love as disposable. So he's sent back to the capital and Dr. Gore reveals, oh, that was just a test for you to learn about being a peacekeeper and the districts. Guess what? You're going to study under me at the university now. So he goes back and because he was pretending to be friends with Sejanus, the plinths adopt him as their heir. So he has money now as well as power. We learned from the Dean that Snow's dad and the Dean came up with the idea for the Hunger Games, but the Dean only intended it to be theoretical. And Snow's dad dropped that proposal off to Gaul but without the Dean's consent. And that's why the Dean hates Snow, because he feels responsible for the Hunger Games when he didn't mean to be. And after that, he became addicted to this drug called Morphling. So Snow goes into his office and 
throws this morphling in the garbage knowing that the dean will find it and he's poisoned it so he's killed the dean and his ambition is so startling because the final sentence is snow lands on top so it's like he'll get rid of anyone to get where he wants to be and that is so scary to think about and he talks about how when he gets married he won't pick someone he can fall in love with. He wants someone weak or someone that he hates so he can't be manipulated. Scary, scary, scary. <laughs> Those are all my thoughts on the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins, the prequel to The Hunger Games. Thank you so much for joining me on that journey, quite a journey. I hope you enjoyed my review. If you did, please like this video and subscribe down below so you don't miss out on any pop culture goodness in the future. Please leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Do you think Lucy Gray is dead? Did you like this book? Did you think it was problematic? Do you like villain origin stories? Did you root for Corio in the start? Who was your favourite character? What was your favourite part? What did you think would happen? I'd really love to know. Do you think a movie will be made of this? I think so, because it's quite action-packed. Who would you cast as 18-year-old Snow and Lucy Gray? I'm Jade the Beamer. Here are all of my socials. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Goodreads. I'll leave a link in the description below so you can find me. Next Monday, I'm going to be uploading my full review on the anime Haikyuu. It was my favourite anime watch of 2020 and I'm so excited to talk to you about anime and volleyball. So stay tuned for that one. I'll put it up for you next Monday. Again, thank you so much for watching. It means a lot to me and I really enjoyed discussing this ballad with you. If you have any recommendations for villain origin stories, please let me know. I'd really love that. <laughs> Take care and I'll catch you next time, songbirds. Goodbye!